During World War II, in the Pacific, east of the Philippine Islands, October 1944, a Japanese surface force of 23 ships, including battleships and cruisers, led by battleship Yamato, jumped a small task force of American destroyers, destroyer escorts, and small escort carriers. The Americans were heavily outgunned, but rather than run, the tiny destroyers and destroyer escorts turned and attacked the larger enemy force, ultimately covering the escape of many of the escort carriers. This task force was known as Taffy 3. It is so amazing to have you guys here with us tonight. This is Museum Ship Mafia, where we take you behind the scenes of museum ships across the country, around the world. My name is Ken Stano with the YouTube channel History X. And tonight we've got another broadcast, a crossover broadcast for you, three YouTube channels. So therefore, it's not just me. I'm going to bring John Epp along with us curator of the uss slater john how is it over at the slater tonight oh it's great well all right okay <laughs> thanks john <laughs> and You're welcome you know uh like i said crossover event we've done this before this is uh the actual second one that we've done so john Epp, curator of the buff uh uss slater albany new york but i also need to introduce you to these guys and if it wasn't for them they're the ones that came up with this idea for the crossover event. So we've got Shane Stevenson, curator. We've got Steven Tedesco, educational director of the Buffalo Naval Park. Are you guys all settled in? Yeah, we're good. We're settled in as much as we could be, ready for this hour, hour and 15 minute ride. Yeah, right, which might turn into an hour and a half, maybe two hours, who knows. And of course, there's someone else I need to introduce and of course, it's all the viewers and subscribers that are checking in with us tonight. And we don't, we couldn't really do this without you watching. So we appreciate people. I mean, before the broadcast even started, I was trading uh, messages with Sonny the Soccer Cat, which I love that name. <laughs> George Newman. Uh, I saw Ivan there. Uh, guys, let me know if I'm missing anybody. The the fact. Oh, I see Ed Webster there, which is always cool to have Ed there. Without the subscribers and the viewers, what's the point? So we appreciate you guys tuning in. And with that being said, before we get started, I basically want to congratulate the uh, USS Slater. A month ago, you were at 600, John. Now you're at 650 subscribers. Yeah, since our last live broadcast, we've gained over 50 subscribers. Um, I imagine most of them have come from this live stream. So thank you for that. It's been great. Awesome. Yeah, no, fantastic. I, yeah, the whole point, in my opinion, of doing this is to make sure that, you know, we give you the support, the support you guys need. And one of the best ways you can support the Buffalo Naval Park or the USS Slater is also one of the easiest, which is just simply click subscribe. So if you're a fan of museum ship videos, if you're a fan of World War II naval action and you want to hear more stories about that. You need to check out these guys and their YouTube channels because they post behind the scene videos. They post historical content. Uh, John Epp uh, and uh, Shane, I've seen them crawl all over their respective ships. So it's really fascinating stuff to watch. And as I said a few moments ago, if you haven't already, please click and subscribe. Um, the other thing I want to mention, and let me, I'm going to get to a bigger screen is this right here which i forgot to mention last month what this is is this is a ship's coin buffalo naval park and it was uh received actually it was my mother's husband dave arbogast made a donation to the buffalo naval park and then you guys sent this coin which i have to admit is a pretty heavy piece of hardware <laughs> that's good yeah, we, we try to come out with one every year, and uh, thanks to your stepdad uh, for uh, his support and for 
the support of all the subscribers as well. So we got to do a twenty hundred. Yeah, and twenty one hundred watch. A twenty hundred watch challenge going. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, sounds good. Thank you. And uh, and if you guys are into ship co ships coins, uh, John was telling me just before the broadcast started, uh, you guys also have them at the Slater, correct? We do. Yeah, you can go right on our website, usslater.org, and you can just purchase one. Oh, okay. And it looks like George has one. Um, and that's one thing I wanted to mention. Uh, obviously, you can click and subscribe to support Thanks, these guys. But please, when it comes to the USS Slater, check out www.ussslater.org. Buffalo Naval Park is buffalonavalpark.org. They've got all kinds of information there if you want to figure out how you can support them further. Uh, let's see. Shane, you said you wanted to tackle a couple things before we got started with Taffy 3, correct? Do, yeah, sure. Do, um, do you want to? No, no, you go ahead. Sorry, let's say yeah, So go um, we made mention uh, last time that we're going to the HIMSA conference, which is at Pearl Harbor this year, or actually it's on the USS Missouri. Um, Shane kind of came up with this crazy idea that we should drive part of the way. Uh, so we mapped out a road trip <laughs> where we'll be going to the USS Edson in Bay City, Michigan. We'll be going to the U-505 in Chicago, which is a German submarine. Oh, okay. Now that'll um, be cool. We're going to the Sullivan's Museum and the uh, place where their house was and mm -hmm. the cemetery where their parents are buried and the school. Uh, we'll be stopping there in Iowa before we fly off to San Francisco and spend a couple of days there, which is where the uh, Sullivan's was built. Um, we'll be visiting that dock Pier as well. 70, yeah. in San Francisco. So we spent a couple of days in San Francisco before we fly off to Hawaii. So Shane and I are taking a 12 day road trip together. So we'll see if we're still <laughs> friends after that. Yeah. I really and, like to thank and when is it? When is this going to be? Uh, like, for example, if you're coming through Chicago, I wouldn't mind uh, catching up with you at the 505. Oh, uh, yeah. We'll be in Chicago September 7th and 8th. Okay. Okay. Let us know if you're going. Well, if we'll, grab you an extra, we'll grab you a Cubs ticket because uh, I'm <laughs> taking Shane to his first baseball game. Well, if anyone's in Chicago and they want to meet up with these guys at the uh, 505, yeah. take them up on it. I'm sure and it's we'll going to be, be live. We'll be doing live snippets and live shows yeah. um, throughout, so you guys can keep up with us. We'll we'll have um, you know like little updates throughout the weeks, and then we'll have uh, episodes that we put together once we get back. Uh, yeah. Who's driving and whose car are you using? <laughs> uh, we rented a car, and we're both driving. Yeah, it, it will be a <laughs> it will be a fun challenge. We'll see how we get along for fourteen days. But, are uh, you guys sharing a hotel room, or do you have separate hotel rooms? Uh, for the first, for the road trip part, we are sharing hotel rooms. Once we get to Hawaii, we have separate rooms. Yeah. Okay. John, will we see you in Hawaii, John? Or I will not be there. No. Yeah. Someone's got to stay back at the Slater and hold down the fort. Understood. Understood. That's true. Okay, that was our that was kind of yep, our that was, that was update. Our thing. But yeah. we hope to see everyone there. You know, or join us on our adventure. Well, uh, yeah, I want to hear more about that. I don't, know, I don't know if this is a good idea or a bad idea, but if I get the chance to meet you guys at the 505, I think that'll be worth it. Um, now, tonight, of course, we're talking about uh, Taffy 3, Battle Off Samar. We've got 42 people watching right now. Please, if you have questions, comments, submit them. We will answer them, or at least do our best to answer, answer them. We want to know what's on your mind. But if you're also going to be watching this on replay, don't stop with the questions. Feel free to submit any com uh, questions you have in the comments section. And even after this video is done, we'll do our best to answer them for you. So don't forget to comment. And with that being said, who's who can set the stage uh, when it comes to Taffy 3? Well, uh, I could do a little of that. Like it's, um, you know, because when you're taking like the whole late, Operation. It could be pretty complex, right? They consider it the largest uh, naval battle the world has ever seen. Uh, you have a, it's over the course of a couple of days, but it's really interesting. And you really kind of map it out uh, to see what what was actually happening. And yeah, I did actually make a map and I drew arrows and lines. So really, what you had was the American force with the island hopping. They wanted to get to the Philippines so they can 
uh, so they can cut off Japan from their oil reserves that were in Indonesia and Singapore and putting, uh, conquering the islands would allow them to effectively cut the Japanese uh, main islands off from their oil reserves down uh, south. And uh, so that was kind of the premise for it. Uh, you had the seventh fleet with Admiral Kincaid, and he was controlling uh, the fleet, but also the army and the Marine landing on the islands. Uh, and then you had the third fleet with uh, Halsey that was uh, kind of screening and protecting uh, the seventh fleet uh, and Admiral Kincaid's forces. So the Japanese were like, you know, interested in basically preventing landing and this conquering uh, from taking place. And so they brought, it's kind of, you know, the Japanese uh, during World War II, they love these real complex uh, battle schemes and, and uh, things like that. They always wanted that one big battle that would just knock out the Americans. Uh, so they, what they did was they brought, and I know we'll get into this, Ken, a little bit. They brought that diversionary force of aircraft carriers down from the home islands while simultaneously bringing up cruisers and battleships from those oil fields in Indonesia and Singapore. Uh, and then they split the Southern force into the center force and the Southern force while bringing the third pincer, I guess, element down uh, from uh, the Japanese islands. And so that's what they really wanted to kind of bring those battleships and cruisers and destroyers up from the south, pinch while diverting. And you know, we'll talk about that, uh, we'll see, uh, but, you know, and to divert some of the American fleet. So you had the third fleet with Halsey protecting the seventh fleet of Kincaid uh, and Taffy Three was part of Halsey's third fleet. So that kind of hopefully well, gives and, everyone... Uh, yeah, yeah, and so you had you said you had the um, the one Japanese uh, uh, diversion force that that grabbed Halsey's attention, and that's really what that's really what set up Taffy Three to be on their own, correct? Yeah, to to my reading of it, yeah, absolutely. That was so basically the third fleet. That center force was attacked by Halsey's third fleet and the uh, planes from the uh, carriers. Uh, and then, of course, the center fleet turned around and fainted like they were going, uh, they were retreating. And so Halsey read that and said, okay, they're retreating, but now we have this other force coming from Japan, coming from the north. And, you know, he was he was a carrier destroyer. If he could, if he could destroy a carrier, he wanted, you know, uh, you know, the hit fast, hit hard, hit often. What was it? Hit, hit hard, hit fast, hit, hit often. And so, yeah, he kind of took the bait there. Uh, they, you know, I don't remember the number, but I think they sank two or three carriers, even though the carriers were a diversionary force. So they still, uh, you know, they st still were successful. Uh, but yeah, it left he left that Taffy 3 uh, force to kind of still protect Kincaid and the 7th Fleet. Uh, but when the center force turned around, boom, they run right into them. Okay, so then let's once Halsey takes the bait and pulls his forces away, and like you said, he did sink a couple of carriers, so it wasn't a wasted effort, but it did leave Taffy Three basically behind. And so, what ships? What ships are we talking about that made up Taffy Three? Oh, I think we can all talk about that, right? We've got the destroyers, the Hearman, the uh, Johnston, and the Hull, and John. Yeah, so destroyer escort. You have the Dennis, Raymond, John C. Butler, and of course the Sam would be Roberts. And then of course they're they're protecting the escort carriers. Yeah, so you yeah. got the Fanshawe Bay, Gambier Bay, um, mm -hmm. Kalinan Bay, Kickin Bay, and of course Saint Lowe. For I believe the Saint Lowe was the first was it the first ship hit by a kamikaze or sunk by a kamikaze. I don't quite remember, but yeah. the yeah uh, this this uh, this conflict was the first one that the Japanese employed the Kamikaze as uh, as a tactic. So that's real interesting. Oh wait, so really I didn't I didn't know that this was this was the first 
You mean Late Take Golf was the first time Kamikaze's ever made an appearance? I didn't even know that. Yeah, to my reading and understanding of it, that was, uh, you know, right. It, if Once they're cut off from the oil in the South, uh, you know, I mean, they were really struggling industrially mm -hmm. at that time. And I think that became a tactic. And yeah, as I said, they used it successfully. Uh, and there were some other aircraft hit by uh, kamikazes as well. And of course, the Americans were kind of flabbergasted. They had no idea what was going on, you know, for, for a bit. Well, and as I understand it, you're talking about, okay, so we're in October of 1944. Um, you know, we're well into the third year of World War II, or at least America's involvement of World War II. And uh, so the Japanese are kind of in retreat. And this was after the Marianas, and uh, which the Japanese had a huge loss of pilots. So the skill wasn't there. And I'm assuming now they're resorting to the kamikaze tactics that you saw. Yeah, I think a lot of it played into that. Uh, okay, you know they were they were just, you know, right three hundred. They were losing like two, three hundred planes and pilots, like every time, every time they went into battle with us. And just to refill that up after the months go on, and to replenish those, uh, to replenish uh, the stock, so to speak. Uh, and yeah, I think the tactic changed because it was they were getting desperate, certainly. And uh, it, they knew if they now here's why, I, here's why I wanted to cover the subject with you guys, because for those of you that are, are new to what we're doing here, you may not be aware, John Epp, curator of the USS Slater, which is a destroyer escort in Albany, New York. And then you've got Shane and Steven there at the Buffalo Naval Park, which has the USS, the Sullivan's, a Fletcher class destroyer on display. And of course, those two uh, styles of ship basically make up Taffy three along with the escort carriers. Yeah. There were six yeah. escorts three and five Butler class, um, for the battle of Samar. So then, you? Oh no, I'll get back in a second. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I mean, that, so, and giving an idea of what they were going against, I mean, the Japanese, uh, Navy had 11 destroyers, two light cruisers, six heavy cruisers, three ba three battleships, and the Yamato. So, um, I mean, in comparison, it was kind of ridiculous how what we <laughs> growing up against there. And they had uh, the Yamato, but then they have their also their other sister uh, super battleship, the M M Musashi. Musashi is it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That was sunk the night before, I believe. Yes. Uh, yeah, as I understand, it was yeah, it was sunk the yeah. night before. The uh, well, then okay. So, John, you actually have been doing a lot of research on the Samuel B. Roberts, and in about twelve minutes, we're going to have a special guest come on that uh, should add a little bit of information on this subject. But what did you you had said during the last broadcast that I mean you've been hyper focused on that. So what did, what did you want to add or what did you want to mention about the Samuel B Roberts? Um so the Sammy B is a John C Butler class destroyer escort. Uh for reference the Slayer is a Cannon class destroyer escort. Uh so we're a little different. Uh, actually behind me you can see uh on the front of the Slayer we have 3 inch 50 caliber deck guns. Sammy B has the 5 inch guns like like um like the Sullivans. Uh, just less. What kind of stood out is she kept her torpedo tubes. Uh, the Slater, her torpedo tubes were removed relatively shortly after her commissioning. Sammy B kept her torpedo tubes and only three torpedo tubes, but that is kind of what made the difference for her. Um, she did some pretty severe damage with the torpedo tubes uh, as well as her 40s, her 5-inch, and of course her 20 millimeters. Nice. Uh, wait, how many torpedo tubes or how many torpedoes did these guys have on board? <laughs> a destroyer escort has three torpedoes. Uh, Just a Fletcher three. has 10, I believe. Yeah, they had, uh, yep. 10, uh, two yeah. quintuple mounts of five each. And so that was used very effectively in the first part of the battle. Uh, I did not realize that they had three torpedoes. 
Yeah, I, I didn't the destroyer escorts. Yeah, that's it. And, and by towards the end of the war, most of them were taken off because destroyer escorts are hunting submarines or yeah. or doing uh, anti aircraft. They're not supposed to go up ship to ship. Uh, if a destroyer escort is getting close enough to use her torpedoes, uh, yeah. it means something something bad is happening, yeah. uh, which we see in Tacky Three. Well, and one of the things that you know, I should probably mention Horn Fisher's book, Last Stand of the Tin Can Sailors, because uh, if you if if those of you watching this video have not watched or I'm sorry, have not read that book, it's it's eye opening. I, I highly recommend it. There's a link to that book in the description below of this video. Check it out. You're going to love it. One of the things I always thought was that this took place at night, but it didn't. It actually took place at dawn. And one of these things, one of the things that the destroyers and destroyer escorts had to do was lay smoke. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. they activated their chemical smoke generators and overloaded their boilers with fuel, mm -hmm. um, which basically made black smoke appear. And it was raining at the time, too. So that also helped the United States kind of regroup before that, like, kind of surprise. Um, and then the other ships wound up following suit after the Samuel Roberts did that. Yeah. Now, yeah, one, one of the things that, uh, well, one of the things I enjoy about your channels is that you guys really go into depth about the equipment on board. And I wanted to mention that Shane actually did a video about how the Fletcher class destroyer generated smoke and oh. Steven mentioned chemical <laughs> generators, but there's also there's there's also a method where you just pour raw fuel into the system and it creates just god awful clouds of smoke, correct? Yeah, that's correct and that's a that, that's a screenshot from the video. Thank you for that, Ken. Uh <laughs> and yeah, there's there's um one burner that is just dedicated to just flooding uh the boiler with fuel and it right just creates that real thick smoke. The chemical smoke would have been on the back of the stern that I was mentioning uh, that created the chemical smoke as well, the canisters. Uh, so, yeah, they really needed to screen the the Jeeps, the Jeep carriers. Uh, and uh, as Steve mentioned as well, the rain, you know, and the squalls really helped um, them do some concealing while the Johnston just went, let's roll. He went, he went, he went right for it. Well, okay. So then, John, the purpose of making all of this smoke, what was the whole goal? Um, it's, you can kind of say it's twofold. Uh, camouflage. Uh, you're screening carriers. You want to hide them, uh, especially against a superior force. So that's what these guys were doing then. Um, try to convince the Japanese uh, the carriers just aren't worth it to attack, make it harder to see them. But also, if you're laying a bunch of smoke, just these two ships in this photograph here. So this is actually the, I believe it's the Hearman and the Destroy Escort in the back. I don't believe it's a Sammy B. Um, looking at clearer photos, the Dazzle doesn't really match up. Mm -hmm. But um, with just two ships laying smoke, you can make it seem like there's even more. And one of the great things about Taffy 3's um, charge into the center force is they convinced the Japanese they were going up against a much larger fleet than they actually were. Yeah, which yeah, the then, diversity, which then kind of confused them. Yep. Yeah, yeah, and and the diversity of the weaponry too. That was, you know, because they were also being uh, the center force is also being attacked by the air, right? So the escort were launching their twenty nine planes or however many there would be on a jeep carrier, you know, twenty five, twenty nine. So they were getting the the Japanese center force was getting hit by uh, planes. Uh, the 40 millimeters, the five inch guns, torpedoes. So just the diversity of munitions kind of led also the Japanese to say, hey, the, you know, there's more here than we can we can see. Am I correct in saying when it comes to the museum ship side that and let me see if I can find a picture. Uh, there are no escort carriers left on display. Is that correct? I don't believe so. I that want to say they idea. tried, but I don't think it ever came to fruition. They yeah, they tried point. they tried to save one. Yeah, I I don't remember which one, but I, I believe they there was some effort. 
but Got I mean, it. these things are okay. so they're so tiny. They're essentially a cargo ship with a flight tech on top of it. Um, <laughs> it, it. They're tiny next to a destroyer escort, basically, and that's saying something. Oh, I had no idea there was that. They were that small, um, but I do know I'm they were slow. But yeah, you know. yeah. Well, I do know <laughs> they were slow, and I do know that the destroyers and destroyer escorts had to, well, basically cover their escape. Yeah, yeah. While they being was... able to launch, you, you know, planes against the center force as well, which was so instrumental. You know, so they center force had gotten some damage. The Southern force was totally obliterated uh, by Admiral Oldendorf, I believe his name was. So that's that that Southern part of the pin was uh, destroyed. So the center force is what's left and they had taken some damage. Uh, you know, they had taken some damage the, the day before the night before. Uh, so they weren't at full strength either, but you know, they had already been through a battle and turned around uh, and so they just probably felt they're matching this, finding the same resistance. Um, Ken, we can go back to your last comment. The the escort carriers, they're very slow. They're not meant for speed. Um, mm. And the problem with going up against the Japanese center force, they were faster. So even if uh, they didn't send in the destroyers and destroyer escorts, most likely the center force would eventually caught up to the carriers. And if you lose your carriers, you lose everything. Yeah, like like what's the point at that particular uh, situation? Then you're not you don't have anything more to protect, I guess. Um, exactly. Yeah. You know, I'm actually surprised how quickly we we blew through that. Like I said, I've got a special guest coming up that I think you guys are going to be very interested in. Um, he's actually logged on. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring him on right now, but I have a feeling we almost might need to do another broadcast or two on this subject because I know <laughs> John's got a whole setup on the Sammy B. Um, and and we just... I, I, it's perfect that you're bringing him because, you know, I could just have him talk about it. He's, he's, he's... <laughs> well, all right. So here, here's what we're going to do. We're, we're going to bring... We're going to bring on a guy by the name of Park Stevenson on on with us. Parks, welcome. Park Stevenson, I'm just going to give you a little bit of background. He is a deep ocean explorer and an engineering manager out of San Marcos, California. Parks is a graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy with over 20 years as a naval officer. And he's even uh, joined expeditions down to the Titanic. He's uh, co-authored a book with film producer and director James Cameron called Exploring the Deep, the Titanic Expeditions. Uh, well, Parks, thanks for joining us tonight. Well, thanks for having me on. Uh, can this uh, broadcast handle two Stevensons at the same time? <laughs> yeah, I know. I, well, uh, I'm a PH. Are you a PH or a V, sir? I wouldn't be anything other. <laughs> nice. Oh wait, is that a yeah. P or a P? A? PH? No, no, your your last names are both Stevenson with a PH. So yeah, you might be related. Now, um, <laughs> as as I understand it, Parks, you you have not only visited the USS Slater, but you have also been to the Buffalo Naval Park, correct? I have not been to the well. Wait a minute, I take that back. I have been to the Buffalo Naval Park many years ago when I was um, transiting between film shoots on another project and I was going up mm -hmm. to Maine to the studio up there and we stopped off at Buffalo. Well, yeah, we stopped off at Buffalo Naval Park on the way. Okay. And, and like I said, a few moments ago, you've dove down to that uh, Titanic, but I mean, let's face it, who hasn't at this particular point? Matter of fact, I'm thinking about going down there over Thanksgiving. Um, I think Airbnb might even have it on their site. So we've been talking about the Taffy 3, the USS Johnston, the USS Samuel B. Roberts. What could you possibly have to add to our discussion that we haven't already thrown out there? Well, um, we found the wrecks of Johnston and Sammy B., uh, deepest shipwrecks in the world uh, on the western edge of the Philippine Trench, which um, they, they're, uh, Johnston was about 6,500 meters deep, which is, you know, 
almost twice as deep as Titanic is. Um, there's a CG model that I did of the wreck. Oh. Uh, I'm going to show you what condition she's in. Uh, she originally, uh, a debris field had originally been found in 2019 by Vulcan Incorporated, which was a Paul Allen uh, funded uh, organization. Uh, you're getting ahead of me here. And, yeah, 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 uh, yeah. Well, here, and I, I want to interrupt you real quick. Okay. The, the reason I was so excited to talk to you, and I talked yesterday, you actually went down as part of the expedition to find the USS Johnston, as, as well as a year later, last spring, uh, the Samuel B. Roberts. So you were there. I, yes, I, I was there. I actually dove on the Johnston wreck and uh, was sitting right right next to her <laughs> um and actually it was that dive that really changed my life uh I had to go down in the deepest part of the ocean called the halo zone which is six thousand meters down to eleven thousand meters is the deepest spot in the ocean and uh, while i was down there um i basically saw it as our future and down there in that deep was johnston sitting upright, uh, buried in the sand up to her um, waterline, guns trained out, looking just as fierce as she did in 1944, but um, very badly riddled, very, very badly damaged by the action on the surface. And what we have when we have a wreck like Johnston or Sammy B is we have a time capsule. That ship has not changed one iota since 1944. In that deep of an ocean, lack of oxygen, lack of uh, sea life, organisms, um, just just the overall environment is essentially preserves the ship. Uh, and like I said, she hasn't changed hardly at all since 1944. She did break in two on the way down. Uh, the debris field found in 2019 only found fragments of her stern. It appears that um, uh, that one or two of her depth charges detonated after she sank. Uh, this would have happened after the stern broke free of the bow section. The bow section is the forward two-thirds of the ship, and the forward two-thirds of the ship are what we found in 2021. Uh, the debris field that Vulcan found in 2019 kind of was a signpost that led us to the actual main body of the wreck, which was uh, a couple hundred, 300 meters deeper than the uh, debris field. She essentially tried to slide down into the trench, but you can see her buckle plates there at the aft end of, of the section there uh, acted as a speed brake and stopped her from sliding all the way into the trench. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, okay, so gentlemen, at this particular point, now that uh, we know who our guest is, Parks, I mean, do you have, I, I, I have, to, I myself, I'm an outsider. I'm, I'm not involved in museum ships at all, other than I'm just a fan. So I'm fortunate enough to be able to be talking with you guys. But, you know, Shane and Steven uh, with the uh, Buffalo Naval Park and then John with the USS Slater, when they made this discovery, what did that mean for your museums um i mean what well, we did the comparison video between the johnston and the um the sullivan so it was it was i mean just watching what we were able to watch from the johnston was amazing but able to being able to compare it to the sullivan's and kind of see what parts were which um I mean, it was awesome. It, it was an awesome experience making that video and editing and yeah. putting it together because when I'm editing a video, um, you know, I will go in and do a little bit more research on it to make sure that I'm basically stitching it together correctly and any any graphics or anything that I add. So it's, you know, it's one thing to read about the discovery of the Johnson. It's another thing to be listening to the guy that discovered. <laughs> oh, so that's pretty awesome um kind of nerding <laughs> out a little bit right here so <laughs> but um yeah i mean th these are things that and i mean in our industry these are amazing discoveries so yeah and as as parks had said it is the way she was because she's so deep um you know and looking at that model the, those even in the model that you're showing 
there's parts that I'm looking at, I'm kind of studying, I'm trying to study. I'm like, okay, well, what happened to Mount 53? And, you know, and that's obviously, you know, uh, disconnected, I guess, from there. But let me see the stacks. I can't even believe the torpedo, the quintuples are still kind of standing, you know, uh, intact and looking at Mount 51 and 52, both trained. Uh, I mean, it's just an astounding window. And, and that it's just, yeah, it's chilling. The window that this shows yeah so i i do have a question for you parks real quick so the first time you went down you guys weren't able to like positively id it right and it wasn't until the second time well um, okay you... so the the vulcan effort was separate and actually um studying their video which they posted on youtube in october of 2019 um we were already planning uh, expedition to try and find some of the wrecks of ships of Samar. And I jumped on the, um, the, uh, the debris field imagery that Vulcan posted. And based on what I could see, well, then I had to, um, I needed some help. And for me, the best help was USS Kidd in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Mm -hmm. She was, you know, she, as you both know, uh, she's a Fletcher class destroyer like the Sullivans. She's closer to her World War II configuration. And um, seeing the debris field, I wasn't sure if we went, if we could find the main body, if there was a main body. I expected that there might not be much to identify from. So instead of studying pictures, which tell you what the ship kind of looked like when it was new, I needed to go study the ship in detail so that I could, if it was torn apart in pieces like the debris field indicated it might be, I would be able to recognize. But aboard Kid, I saw a couple of clues that told me that the debris field they had found was in fact Johnston. At the time, the Vulcan team um, were unsure if it was Johnston or Hull. They were both sister ships, very close in uh, configuration. The only difference between between them were the small little modifications made by the two different shipyards that were built in. But they were very close. It could have been Hull. And one thing that stood out to the Vulcan team was they found a um, decapitated five-inch mount top that had the mount captain's blast shield on. Um, at that time, the only pictures that we had of Johnston did not appear to show any blast shields, but the pictures of Hull that were available showed that she had them on almost nearly every mount. Uh, in the debris field were the remains of Mount 53, Mount and another mount, which was a, a top of deck house, so it was either 52 or 54. And then there was pieces of a mount scattered around. Uh, there was a, a five-inch training ring torn out of the main deck upside down. So that was either Mount 51 or 55. And um, what was key for me was aboard the kid, there's a unique angled beam uh, after Mount 54 that I could see on this uh it, the, the mount was upside down with the upper handling room sticking up, the deck house sticking up. And there was that angled beam, and that told me that that mount was 54. And, when, and, and if you look down on the bottom, there's the gun barrel lying uh, in the mud, but it's intact. And if you read the action reports for Hull, you know that she took a Japanese shell that uh, cut her cut Mount 54's barrel in half. And that that severed barrel rolled around the deck for a while, corroborated by several different witnesses. So that was my first clue that this was definitely from Johnston. Um, later, uh, as, as we looked at the debris, as I looked at the debris field, I could tell that most of it was from the stern. I didn't see any indication that it was from the bow. And so that made the training ring more Mount 55 than it would have been Mount 51. If it was 55, it was torn out of the main deck, but it was intact. Again, going by the Hull's damage report, she took a shell right in her training ring, which froze the mountain train early in the battle. 
this training ring was not damaged. There's another clue that was Johnson. And then there were a couple of pieces of um, um, light steel plate plating, obviously from the superstructure, painted in five in navy blue. And if you look at Hole's um, camouflage scheme, there was no navy blue in her camouflage scheme. So I, I was pretty sure it was Johnson. I mean, I was 100% I was it was Johnson. I, I'm not going to I'm, I'm not gonna lie. But Victor Descovo, the owner and operator of the uh, submersible limiting factor and support ship pressure drop, and owner of Caledon Oceanic that uh, paid for our expedition in 2021, he was adamant that we needed to find a hole number. That was the only way to prove to the world that it definitely was Johnston. So that was our number one goal in the expedition, was first to find the remains that Vulcan had not found, at the end of their dive, as their their ROV was already at below, well, it was already below its rated pressure drip depth when it found the Johnson debris field. As it kept going, as it kept going uh, east, which was toward the trench, the depth got increasingly deeper and deeper, to the point where they could not go any further without risking losing their ROV. And toward the deepest part of the debris field, they found a. a big gouge in the ocean floor that cut its way down even deeper. And they wanted to go look down there, and they tried to train their sonar down there, but they didn't see anything. They didn't know how far they'd have to go to find anything, if they could find anything, because it could have gone over the edge of the trench into the into the depths. Uh, and in that area, it could be as much as 9,000 meters, way too deep for them to explore. And uh, they had to cut it off then. So uh, we wanted to find that slide area. Victor's limiting factor is a full ocean depth submersible, the only one, the only commercial one in the West. The only other one in the world commercially available right now is uh, owned and operated by the Chinese government. But Victor has a pressure drop, and so depth is not a, pr a problem for him. He can go to any depth. He can follow that trail to wherever it leads. And that was their intent. And that's actually what happened. Uh, that's how we ended up finding the main body of the wreck. At the end of our third dive, uh, and I was not on that particular dive, but Victor was running out of batteries. He lost one of his thrusters, losing half his lights. He came across that slide area. And he uh, he took a chance and followed it down and saw the bow of Johnston and did a quick look at it before he lost power completely, had to surface. And then he and I dove the next day to go down and survey the wreck. This is a photo up here that I took outside my viewport. Uh, as you can see, 557 is just as clear and bright almost as the day it was painted. Uh, a little slight corrosion in the 5N80 paint there. But I found that um, in studying the wreck, that if an area was on fire, you would see corrosion. But if it, if it had not suffered fire during the battle, uh, the paint remained and it's still doing its job of protecting the steel underneath by and large. Uh, I, I have to interrupt you and ask, it's yeah, like okay. when you go when you go down this far, uh, you, what what is it like physically to be in a submersible under that much pressure? I mean, you're you're basically coming close to breaking records. Uh, I mean, are your ears popping? Do you feel different? No, the submersible, what you, takes, what? the submersible takes its own atmosphere down with us. Um, okay. I'm not that brave. Uh, I'm not a, a, like a scuba diver. I have many diver friends who, um, you know, get in the water with their scuba tanks, and they have to uh, compress and decompress as they go down and come back up. They risk uh, embolism in the blood. Uh, none of that in the submersible. Submersible is a titanium sphere that... Its main purpose is to keep that outside pressure at bay. And we have our own, we keep our own atmosphere inside the submersible. We keep it at the one atmosphere of pressure that we're used to on the surface. And that's what we go down with and come back up. We lose a little bit of it. When we open the hatch at the end of the dive, there's a little bit of a decompression. But it's not to the extent where it affects the physical body. Okay, so then that answers, answers the question physically. Uh, mentally, I'm claustrophobic, so I know I could definitely never do this. 
Uh, but when you go down that far, how long does it take to get down that far? How much time can you spend down there before you have to start coming back up? A typical dive is like eight hours. And uh, it's very cramped, especially for a big guy like me. I'm 6'3 and 210 pounds. Well, I like to think I'm 210 pounds. Anyway, um, and it's, I, I often characterize it as sitting back in coach, except without the leg room. Because it is a sphere, so my legs are usually tucked under me for eight hours. Uh, that's the reason why I didn't make the second dive. Uh, or obviously, I'm sorry, the third dive that found the wreck. Because the first dive, my legs were useless, and it took three guys to get me out of the sub. I also tried to do a crash diet before the dive, try to lose a few pounds. And all that did was make me weak and susceptible. So I got taken off the dive rotation and missed the discovery of the wreck. But, you know, that's lesson learned. Um, and um, it, it's, uh, it, it takes about an hour and a half to two hours. I, I take that back. It was about an hour and a half to get down to Titanic. A little bit over two hours to get down to Johnston. And um, then we spend the rest of the time. And, and of course, there's going to be another couple hours to come back up at the end. So you normally spend about four hours or so uh, exploring the bottom. It's important to us because a, a big difference between us and the Vulcan guys, they had a wide ocean search capability. They had one vehicle that they could program to run around for 24 hours on the bottom with a side scan sonar and scan a huge area. And once it comes back and they review those scans, they look for anomalies, and then they send a remotely operated vehicle, which has a camera and an operator that's attached to a tether to the ship that goes down and explores those anomalies. We don't have any of that with the pressure drop and limiting factor. It's really incumbent upon the historian to re-navigate the battle and put the pressure drop over the dive site and and then find that wreck. And um, we didn't have the location of the debris field. That kind of information is, is held close to the chest. So we had to refine the debris field, and then from the debris field, refine the main wreck. And it's like, it, it is literally akin to looking for a small needle in a large, wet haystack. We had, when we dove on Sammy Roberts, we calculated our chances of finding the Sammy B in a typical dive to be less than one half of a percent chance of finding. Oh. That's crazy. That's wow. insane. Well, so it well, takes a I mean, there's a lot of looking for. there's a lot of historical analysis. Um, I worked with a guy named Rob Lundgren, and later uh, Anthony Tolley would join in uh, the, the work. Uh, he's, he's a big expert on Midway. Ah, there's a picture of the Sand B torpedo tubes, that triple, triple setup that we talked about. That was found on the end of one dive that went to go look. And I'm going to make a confession here. The spot that I chose to dive, I thought we would find Gambier Bay, and instead we found that. And... When the guys on that dive came back and showed me the picture of the triple torpedo tube, I went, holy shit, we just found the Sammy B. Roberts. We weren't, she was so small, we really did not think we had a conceivable chance of finding it. We were going for the biggest, Gambier Bay, and we stumbled across the smallest. And she's only 2,000 yards away from Johnson. So there's that was a little my story with Commander Copeland, who was the commanding officer of the Sam B. Roberts. He talked about toward the end as Sandy B sinking. He saw a damaged destroyer go by that he called the Johnston. Some of the damage that he describes better describes Hull's damage. We can go on that another time. But he did talk about uh, Commander Evans on the stern of Johnston directing his ship by shouting orders down to the emergency steering room through a, through a, a scuttle on the fan tail. And he waved to him as the last he saw him. When we found Johnson and Sammy B and it applied it to our renavigation efforts, their tracks do converge at a point. 
and basically cooperates Commander Copeland's account of seeing the Johnston steam by, limp by, as, as uh, right there in the final moments, just before Johnston would go dead in the water and just before Sammy B. Roberts would go under. But what you're seeing here are some of the shots from Sammy B. Um, this happens to be the starboard side. These are the K-gun racks, and yes, that is a depth charge, an unexploded depth charge stuck in that rack. So, um, yeah. What does a what does a what does a munition do at you know over three miles down um, at, at sixty eight hundred meters? What what does a munition do? We don't know. I don't think anybody knows. So when you're in a submersible and you see something like this, uh, you want to stay the, the hell away from it. Uh, Sandy B, like Slater, has hedgehogs up on her bow. Um, they're painted black. Victor, the pilot of the sub, didn't notice them at first. When I showed him the imagery afterward and said, oh, these are the hedgehogs. You know how volatile these things were on the surface. You, you're pretty close to them on the corner. So anyway. Um, I mean, guys, what, what questions do you have for, for Parks or what's, what's coming to your mind when he starts to describe the kind of research that went into trying to figure out where they can drop so that they know they're going to be close? Uh, I did have a question about the Johnston that um, you had touched on the, the fires and the paints um, when you saw the um, hull number. Yeah, go back, go back to the photo. Go back to the photo because that would be relevant, I think, to this question. Go ahead. So um, where you see the discoloration on the – above the number is that associated with the fire it might be but this picture right here is a very good evidence of a fire now what one one thing i was able to do with johnston is i could see all of her damage and i got together with the john hole survivors association collected all of their written uh eyewitness stories and basically used those as a timeline so that I could assign um, times, roughly speaking, and or, or, or actually in a larger sense, a sequence to the hits that Johnston took toward the end. And what we're seeing here was a devastating blow at about 0940 when two shells from Congo hit in her forward boiler room which is, this is the number one stack we're seeing here, this silvery thing. It's actually the, the lining of the stack. The shell of the stack is just gone. Uh, right. It's the same in the debris field, too. The, the, the other half of this stack is up in the debris field uh, several hundred meters away, and it's aluminum like this. But uh, you can see it, it, it looks like a mess. It does not look like a pristine wreck here. There was evidently a major fire in this area. Uh, it could have it could have been burning prior to the hit, but it definitely was burning um, after this shell went into the forward fire room. Uh, the uptake going up to the number one stack is blown out at the base of the stack, and the whole stack itself has canted back a few degrees and has basically collapsed into the galley, which is all gone. But what you're seeing in this picture here is the kind of very advanced corrosion you'll see in the areas that burn during the battle on the surface. The, the straight that you're talking about above the number, uh, I think that was what, uh, E straight, F straight? Um, yeah, let me um, see if I can find that. It, it, had, it, it evidently suffered some kind of trauma that, that made that straight. And you'll notice that the, the paint is different it, it, it's confined to the straight the lines of the straight and then it could have been painted a different paint mm. it may not have burned uh you can still see the paint underneath it i almost think that this was um this would this straight was painted at a different time or with a different quality of paint i think i think is what really is the difference in this particular photo here because of you know, there's such a clean line above the yeah. five five seven. Yeah. If it was a fire, it wouldn't it wouldn't be in a, a well defined line like that. No, and there was a fire on the port bow that that burned on the outside. There was two. Uh, there were three hits uh, on the port bow. It started a fire. The five five seven on the other side 
is obscured by the corrosion on that side because of the fire. Um, I don't I don't think I supplied a picture of that. But, um, but anyway, um, we just I, I used all of the photos, not only the photos I took, and I took 500 photos on my iPhone out there. Uh, well, wait, this is with your iPhone that you, you, you took this yeah. with your iPhone? Yeah, and actually it it got better pictures in some instances than the 4K camera on the outside of the sub because the software that controlled the shutter speed on the 4K camera couldn't handle the absolute blackness of the depth is our guess. And that's why this, this imagery is kind of blurry, kind of indistinct. Uh, that's a 4K camera. The iPhone is actually better suited to low-level light situations than the 4K camera was. So yeah, I, I use my iPhone as a backup, and I'm glad I did because I caught some very key shots. Now, what we see here is a similar shot of the bow of the Johnston on the left and the bow of the Sammy B. Roberts on the right, and I included this. Number one, uh, learning a lesson from Johnston, Victor uh, had uh, an improved lighting package made for the for the limiting factor so that we have a little bit more light that we can put out and hopefully illuminate the wreck a little better. And you can see it's a little clearer picture. But also you can see a little bit of difference here in what happened to these two ships. Johnston, the, the four two thirds of the wreck evidently slid into the bottom at a very shallow angle, almost coincident with the slope that she slid down. Sammy B on the other hand, well, oh, and another thing is Johnston was very thoroughly whole during the battle. She lost all of her watertight integrity, which means that when she sank, the hole equalized very quickly before she got to any kind of crushing depth. Sammy B did not take many hits forward of the bridge and took no hits forward of Mount 51. She still had her watertight integrity, and what you can see here with her, with the shape of her bow up toward the stem, is imploded compartments. That because she had watertight condition zebra set, um, she wasn't able to equalize, and and she fell to a depth where it started to crush her hull before something broke and then allowed water in to equalize. But and then where Johnston slid into a soft mud bottom, Sammy B nose right into a rock outcrop and and she did she didn't not, she didn't dive into the bottom at all that rock just basically crumpled her forward bow all the way back to the superstructure so johnson's bow is largely intact but it's little full of holes sammy b's bow is all crumpled and sucked in <coughs> There was another picture I wanted to pull up here that I thought was pretty impressive. <laughs> yeah, this is Mount 51 uh, of the Johnston. This was right outside my viewport. I had to take a picture of that barrel just right at me. Um, okay. Is this one of the forward mounts, Parks? Yeah, it's 51 on Johnston. Nice. Yeah, she she was pointing right at my viewport, so I had to snap the picture. Um, <laughs> I mean, there's the amount of... The point of all this is we went down to survey these wrecks and we went down to get as much information as we could. And from that information, we're looking to see what it can tell us. For Johnston, mm -hmm. I, we actually learned more about what she did in the battle than the histories could tell us. I mean, most of our history of the battle comes from Lieutenant uh, Bob Hagen, a gunnery officer and senior surviving officer aboard Johnston. Oh, that's, that's Mount uh, uh, 43, starboard side on Johnston. Uh, she took a, it looks like she took a round, uh, shell right into her 40 millimeter magazine there, which blew out the back part of that pedestal that, that gun was on. Now, well, and I don't, I, I apologize. I don't want to distract you from your train of thought. I just want to make sure that we get okay. to all these pictures. But, no, but please fine. stick with, stick with that, stick with that thought because uh, you and I were talking about this yesterday, and I found it fascinating to learn what you discovered about the battle after right. you had discovered the wreck. From the wreck, one of the first things that I discovered about this battle, and this is before we dove. When we were doing our renavigation of the battle, um, because this was a surface battle, 
one thing that we could use to help with the re-nav- navigation was to cross-check the American reports with the Japanese, and the Japanese uh, kept a record of when they fired and what they fired, and, um, and, and and usually gave a bearing, usually not a range, but at least a bearing. And we could cross-check that with the American reports and with, with, with our with calculated tracks that people like Samuel L. Morrison had, had calculated years before, and that allowed us to fine-tune the traditional battle tracks. And one of the first things discovered during that process, most people had assumed that the big hit that Johnston took right after uh, her torpedo attack against the lead Japanese cruiser Kumano, she took three massive shells that most historians have attributed to the 14-inch shells from Congo. As we looked into Japanese records, though, we found out at the time that Johnson was hit, Congo was had ceased fire on her main armament and was engaged in an anti-aircraft battle against some pesky aircraft that were attacking her. But who was firing at that time, and this was witnessed by two other Japanese ships and, and entered into their records, was Yamato. She fired at a, an American cruiser. Now, the Japanese did not know that we had these jeep carriers. They had no clue that these existed. So when the Japanese surface force came out of the San Bernardino Strait and saw flat top shapes ahead of them, they thought that the ruse to draw Halsey away had failed and that there were Essex-class carriers ahead of them. And they weren't launching aircraft on a massive scale yet. So, so to Admiral Kuroka, his main chance of going against Halsey's third fleet carriers was to attack as quickly and as thoroughly as possible and keep those carriers from launching their aircraft. Because once they did, then Kuroka's force was going to be finished. So he ordered an all-out attack, basically told everybody just go for it. The cruisers, being the fastest, took off, and they went to intercept. Now, if you have a destroyer in front of what you think is an excess class carrier, it's going to look like a cruiser. And that's why in the Japanese reports, you'll see these constant references to American cruisers, of which there were none there that day. But Yamato describes hitting and sinking a American uh, cruiser at the time that Johnston was hit. And right after Johnston was hit, she was obscured from the Japanese gunners by a combination of her own smoke and the rain squall that happened to pass overhead at that time. And so as far as the Japanese were concerned, that ship disappeared and was presumed sunk. So identifying Yamato as the, as, as the one who hit Johnston first was a major revelation and also set up this whole David versus Goliath thing. And the fact that Johnson survived three 18-inch shells is really a testament to the durability and the toughness of the Fletcher-class destroyers. So, something that we learned. Now, looking at the wreck, I can tell that she broke in half right about where Yamato hit her. And uh, uh, some of the debris in the debris field uh, are, are chunks of main deck that I could identify as coming from the area around the hits. So she was really torn up in that area, but um, but she broke probably because of the damage that she took in that first salvo that uh, that, that, that wounded Johnston for the rest of the day. But yeah. then as I walk through the rest of the damage and align it with survivor reports, I start to see the pattern and, and the timing of hits. Um, could identify the final shells that caused Johnson going dead in the water as having come from Congo. I've uh, got one shell that hit up into the forecastle that took out the forward five-inch magazine that's coming from Suzia. And then she's just peppered with um, five and six-inch shell holes that came from the destroyers and light cruisers that circled her at the end after Congo knocked her engines out. And... Um, you could just you could just see oh in this picture here, if you look at Mount 52 right outside the trainer seat, you'll see a shell hole. This probably came from Yagi toward the end, 
Um, in in um, Lieutenant Hagen's after action report, he describes three hits, one uh, into Radio Central in the superstructure, one into Mount 52, and one that, that also knocked out Mount 51 at the same time. And he gives a time of 910. This one shows the hit on Mount 52. That shell went right into right into the Mount uh, housing, right outside the trainer seat. He probably never knew what hit him. It hit the five inch gun inside and exploded and blew out the back of the Mount, which we can see when we go out around the port side. Uh, that, all, that and 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 and, and it, it also went into the deck house below, so that gave me a trajectory which allowed me to put it back to Yagi. And I don't think I have a picture of that. Uh, oh, okay, it's not something you provided. Yeah, okay, no, no, I, I, I don't yeah so that's like an amazing angle, you know. Like, obviously, after that, the gun is trained and elevated as far as it's going to go once that explosion happens. So, I mean, and that seems to be like it is. That seems to be like it's coming over, you know, the stern and over. I don't know. I don't even know how it would enter at that angle. You no, know, it actually uh, came. It actually came across in an almost flat trajectory. That's how I knew it came from close by. Uh, the one in the forecastle, which 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 was the third hit that hit at about the same time, according to Hagen, that was a plunging shot. We've got the hole on the forecastle, uh, on the you know, up on the forecastle, forecastle deck. And, and then I have the trajectory down into the five inch magazine, which mm -hmm. took out 51 from below. And uh, 51 and 52 were disabled about the same time at 9 10, about an hour before Johnston sank. So, even though when we first saw the wreck, she looked like she was still at battle with her guns trained outward, these two mounts were actually disabled about an hour before she actually sank and was still fighting. And from then on out, it was up to 53, 54, and 55. 53 and 55 were still under limited control from the director atop the uh, pilot house, which you see in the upper left-hand corner there. 54 had lost comms during the Yamato hit, and she was on local control throughout the entire battle. Wow. She got she got some uh, uh, targeting information from the 40-millimeter uh, director right outside of 54, but essentially she fought her own battle the whole, the whole day. Wow. Uh, Johnson's guns fired to the end. Um, uh, this, this is the port side of the bridge of Johnston. You can see uh, shrapnel riddling the um, the uh, director. And in fact, she took a blast on her left side that pushed her viewfinder tube out the right side. And you can see it. You can see the white painted, in, you know, where it was painted white on the interior of the viewfinder tube. You can see it angled out of the director housing there. Now, Hagen and his crew were in that director until almost the very end when, when the abandoned ship was called and they left the director at that time. This hit was would have been fatal to anybody left in, in the director. So that tells me this is one of the late hits after abandoned ship had already been called. But this is the port bridge wing, which I paid particular attention to because this is where Commander Evans was standing during that first salvo from Yamato when um, she evidently she fired both her primary and secondary batteries, primary batteries, 18 inch, hit farther aft, the uh, secondary arm, six, six inch uh, shells hit in this area. One went into the uh, mount uh, 42, the forward 40 millimeter mount started to fire there that would eventually consume the uh, 40 millimeter ammunition up forward and force, eventually force the evacuation of the bridge. Uh, and then one hit somewhere around here uh, that killed a group of officers, killed or mortally wounded a group of officers standing around Evans and uh, injured Evans himself, tore two fingers off his left hand, tore the uniform off his body, peppered him with shrapnel, and he would fight the rest of the battle in that condition, waved away medical assistance, telling him to go, uh, go help people who were seriously hurt. And I spent a long time looking for the impact of that particular shell which wounded these people but I have not yet found it. I, I you know, I, I do notice the, the uh, bridge wing deck is uh, missing aft of where they would have been standing. It's missing like that on the starboard side as well. Um, I, I don't know. I th this is one mystery that I wish we could have gone back to Johnston during the last expedition to uh, to look a little bit harder for that shell impact. But 
that's one that's one answer I haven't definitively answered yet. Where that shell hit. Different witnesses uh, describe it differently. Some believe it came from below. Could have clipped the uh, aft end of the bridge wing and then detonated just under the bridge wing coming up through. But I, I, I don't see any shrapnel damage on the side of the pilot house. Um, there is a theory that I'm exploring right now that maybe maybe it was a blast effect from Mount 52. Uh, Lieutenant Hagen believed to his dying day that he injured Captain Evans uh, because Evans basically gave uh, Hagen permission to fire across the bridge to disregard safety, the safety bubble around the bridge. Um, and yes, 52 has mechanical stops that keep her from, I mean, literally flying it, firing a shell over the bridge, but you can turn it aft far enough that the blast effects could possibly injure people on the bridge. And I do see damage to the Venturi on both sides of the bridge wing at the extreme ends. Uh, you can see it here. The, the outboard edge of the Venturi is ripped up. Um, maybe that came from blast effect from Mount 52. I don't know. But I'm looking at all different kinds of scenarios to try and understand what injured Commander Evans. Um, Shane, Stephen, John, what questions do you have? Go ahead, Shane. We kind of, we kind of hijacked all the questions, John. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm just well, still trying to take it all. Let's in, talk about you know, setting so. D. Um, I, well, here I've, I mean, I've got a I question. Real, I got a question real quick before John gets to the Sammy B. And and whenever uh, you know, somebody like the Buffalo Naval Park creates a video or John posts uh, a video about this subject. I, especially when I post a video about it, people want to know, well, when are they going to find the Gambier Bay? Uh, <laughs> what, wh when do you think they're going to find the hole next? And you had mentioned a few moments ago about the prospects of returning to maybe gather more evidence. What is the possibility of returning to the site to, to look further? Um, so, again, all we know about the location of, of Dambier Bay and Hull are our re-navigation efforts. Um, we've had to, as good as we think they are, and they did get us in the neighborhood, so we found two wrecks. There are two other wrecks we have not found yet. And by the way, Chickam is out there, too, in the general vicinity. We haven't seen her yet, either. But um, the... Um, I, like I said, on the Sammy B dive, we dove on where I thought we would find Gambier Bay. We found Sammy B instead. So now I've got to readjust our renavigation tracks to try and figure out where Gambier Bay is. Um, and by the way, well, I can't, I can't say. It. Never mind. Um, <laughs> Ole is even is even a little bit more sketchy. I mean, for Gambier Bay, we have her reported position where, where she sank. I can tell you she's not there because we looked and she wasn't, but at least we have something. Hole, we have nothing. She charged off into the smoke and the rain and never came back. We, we have a pretty good idea from our rename and where I have Hole currently, she's in the trench about 8,000 meters down. So she's going to be difficult to reach. Without pressure drop and limiting factor, there's no capability out there in the commercial world to look below 6,000 meters. The Vulcan guys, who were no longer funded since Paul Allen's unfortunate passing, um, they couldn't go any lower than 6,000 meters. The U.S. Navy can't go, well, could not go any lower than 6,000 meters until recently when they announced that uh, Alvin has been rated down to 6,500 meters. Alvin could find the Johnston, but she wouldn't be able to reach the Sandy B. So we well, have to. Well, and then let's talk we about have to the Sandy B. I guess like the limiting factor. However, Victor Escobo, owner of it, has been it, it has is currently in the process of selling that system to another buyer, who is not interested in wreck exploration, who is interested only in the scientific exploration of the deep. So after. Uh, uh, limiting factor goes to its new owner. We will have no vehicle to to um, 
explore below 6,000 meters going forward. And this is something that Victor and I have talked about. Victor would like to continue with wreck exploration. He's talking about leasing the system. But like I said, uh, he cannot lease any, anything that can go below 6,000 meters. So the talk has turned to maybe we could fund the development of a system that could go down to at least 8,000 meters, which a number of commercial entities and other governments are exploring at, at the moment. There's an effort underway to retrofit some already fielded ROVs so that they can go deeper, possibly down to six, seven, eight thousand meters. So there is a move afoot, a multinational, multi effort of uh, move to go deeper in the ocean, to start exploring these deeper areas. But we have to wait for that capability at this point before we can go after Gambier Bay and Hull. I don't expect to find Gambier Bay sh any, any shallower than 6,000 meters. And that's all I can say at this point about it. But we would like to find Sorry, John. <laughs> yeah, sorry, John, I cut you off. What questions did you have about the Sammy B? Uh -huh. Um. Okay, so two things. Uh, first, I I have watched Kaladin Edix documentary a million times at this point. Um, and the moments in the in the documentary where they announce that they're at the Sammy B, you see Parks in the corner sitting in a chair, and he doesn't react really. It, it, how did you not react? It, if that was me, I would be jumping up and down, going absolutely bananas. And you just hunched okay. over. Just okay, so, so let, let, let me introduce you to the magical world of television. What you saw <laughs> in that documentary <laughs> was, was a reenactment of the moment because they weren't filming when it actually happened. And I did not think I was in frame. That doesn't believe him. <laughs> so I wasn't, I wasn't expecting to have to reenact my, my excitement. You should have seen me. You should have seen me when I first saw those triple torpedo tubes. I lost my my crap. <laughs> we are all um, geeks out there. Victor is a huge geek. I'm a huge geek. We love this stuff. When we saw Sammy B, I mean, when we saw those torpedo tubes, oh my god! I I couldn't wait for the next day to go to go um, find the rest of the ship. And by the way, before we found the torpedo tubes, they found a helmet veil and the regulator off an of OBA. So we knew we were coming up on a warship, but we didn't know what warship. Could they Gambier Bay? That's what I was expecting. We were starting to see debris from Gambier Bay. But then the next thing that popped up was that. And right. that, there was no question what we, what we were. Yeah, can someone talking. respond? Can you someone respond to. Uh, JV Leisure, uh, and just kind of write down what the documentary was, just so everyone can see that. Um, oh, um, yes. Um, I got it right I, here. I can. I, can I think it. it's called. I, I. I mean, I would have to get off the computer. Right. You know, I would have to change screens. I think it was called the Rex of, of, of Samar. You can find it on YouTube. Okay. It's just a. It's. It's a very. Um, it's it's like a travel log kind of documentary. It's not fancy, no special effects, no CGI, none of that. It's 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 literally a video um, telling of that of, of that expedition, and um, and they, they they put it out uh, very soon after after we got back, um, and um, there is another documentary in work that Victor's going to film. That's going to be more of a um, it's going to have more. It's going to tell more of the story. It's going to be about Johnston. It's going to tell more of the story. It's going to tell the battle. We're going to have uh, maybe a mix of recreations, CGI for sure, uh, to tell the story of the battle, not just the uh, wreck exploration. And it's going to be uh, it's going to be short, twenty to thirty minutes, and Victor will make it available to to the museums to show in their museums. So if you've got a theater, Buffalo Naval Park, which I'm not sure. And John, get yourself a theater. Um, <laughs> this this uh, video will be available for you because we want to get the story out there. 
And this spins so into uh, yeah, this and, and that'll be great for, for like the, for like the Sullivans of the kid because guests will be able to come in, watch that video, and then look out and see a ship that looks like the one they just saw in, in the wreck image. So uh, we're hoping that that would really get this story going. Because that's all. Go ahead, Shane. What were you? Uh... How did the story of these tin can sailors off the mark? How does everybody not know this story? I have some thoughts about this, and they have to do with Halsey, but I'll keep those to myself. <laughs> but um, you know, we, it's time has come that the people like Evans and Copeland, Kent Berger, all those guys needs to know what they did that day. Like. Um, you know, like, and, 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 and Hornfisher brought this out in Last Stand of the Ten Can Sailors when he quoted Herman Wolf. I don't have it in front of me, I'll have to paraphrase it. But the sight of those destroyers charging through the smoke and the rain against insurmountable odds. I mean, the, the, the forward turret of Yamato weighed more than all of the USS Johnson. Just the, just the forward turret weighed more than Johnson. They threw themselves at these battle wagons and cruisers and light cruisers and destroyers. And, and the Japanese brought big guns to the fight. And they lost because what these destroyers did, they brought a more powerful weapon to the fight. They brought the ability to deny Kurita the time to get in with a quick victory. Kurita came, that, that surface force came into the Philippine operating area without logistics. They didn't bring reloads of their shells. They didn't bring fuel tankers with them. And they, they, they were supposed to use their shells and burn their gas to go fire on the beaches of, of Luzon. Mm -hmm. But instead, they encountered this unexpected little troublesome group, which is a backwater support group. It wasn't protecting anything. It was, it was, it was, it was kept out of the way so it would be safe. And they ran across this thing and by all rights, they should have won, but instead, this these little nagging little destroyers ate up their time, burned up their fuel, sucked up their shells, and at a certain point, Clarita goes, "I I I'm wasting my stuff. I'm I'm I've got to. I'm, if I want to salvage anything out of this, I got to call a recall and get out of here, which is what he did. And and when he did that, it's because these small boys went in and hit him with a weapon more powerful than his guns. Okay, I just I just whacked a bullet there. <laughs> I, meant to, I meant to quote Herman Woke, who said that the sight of these destroyers charged with this book uh, is an example of what America does when it does not have an American superiority. So this is a lesson that our, child, that our school children, children should learn and our enemy should ponder. And I think that's the overriding message of this battle. And we can see it in these wrecks. These wrecks, Johnson took enormous punishment, and so did Sammy B. And and they were in a fight they were never meant to be in. And yet they 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 took it, they sucked it up, and they may have sunk, but there but there was meaning behind their sinking. Okay, now John. <laughs> um we since we did a, we looked at the wreck of Johnson. Um, it's up to you, Ken. I know we've been going long. Would you mind if we do like a quick few minutes looking at some photos of the Sammy B wreck? Yes, he's got some, I, I, I have, some just, pictures of Sammy B too. And by the way, John, yeah, while, while he's looking those up and posting them, I want to tell you that right now I'm working with a CG model of Sammy B like I did for, uh, for Johnston. First, I build a CG oh, model awesome. of it, and then I break it down to, to, to do my wreck analysis. I'm, I'm working on the wreck analysis for the NHHC right now, like I did with Johnston. And um, one thing, and I got a lot of blueprints from from Slater. Uh, Ed Jokowski has, has sent me a bunch of stuff. Tim Rizzuto has been, you know, helping get me resources. And what I'm finding is, is that all the blueprints I have here, and I've got 300 series blueprints, I've got 500 series blueprints. I don't have any 400 series. And and all of the reference information I have does not match what I see on the Sammy B. Roberts wreck. So I am right now in building the model, I am cross-checking it with the wreck, and I'm coming up with a ship that is not supported by the blueprints. 
by any blueprints, not even the modeler's blueprints. There's yeah. errors in it. Mm. So when I'm done, I need to get with you and share this information so that you know exactly what Sammy B looked like. Interesting. Okay, yeah, that'd be great. Um, okay. I'll, uh, so, I'll share my screen because then I could do the photos. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Go for it. Yeah, if you can do that. Um, and then he could just uh, rattle Okay, on. so this is obviously the whole number on the uh, uh, port side bow. You can see how crumpled Hold the on bow one is. Hold on Okay. This. Oh, okay. So we're looking at... Okay. All right. So you guys can see the full image, right? Yep, yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. Sure can. Okay, great. Okay. Right, so yeah, there's the torpedo tubes. There's the torpedo tubes. Um, yep, there's a port side bow. You can see the crumpling. Mount 51 is right up here in the upper right-hand corner. Okay. Uh, there's Mount 51 again. Uh, you can just see how there, there, that's a good crumple shot there. What's interesting is that Mount 51 is is trained all the way back against her st stops to port and aft, and Mount 52 is trained against her stops forward and starboard. Right there at the end, Sammy B was engaging targets on both sides. Of her. Wow. <laughs> now, Mount 52, so would, would, would her, her final round would hook off, and we'll talk about that when we get to the picture of it. Again, that's Mount... Oh, go, go back, go back, go back, if you can. Okay, that's Mount 51. There's the hedgehogs just uh, to the right of it. Uh, the 40-millimeter tub, because of the way that the, uh, the main deck is buckled, uh, the, the 40 millimeter tub is almost shoved right down into the hedgehog uh, area. Is You'll see it there. See here? Yeah. See how? Okay. See how? Um, see how it's angled down toward the hedgehogs. Yeah. And you can what just I love make about out the shot of the 40 is yeah, that's a 40 inside the in the 40. Correct? And the and the hedgehogs are down below and to the right, right down in there. Okay. You can see the hedgehog lockers are crumpled by the superstructure. Oh, yeah. Being actually, what it is, the main deck is forced up against the superstructure because of the crumpling. And, and you see that closed chalk there on the deck edge. It's um, it's angled inward, and you can see how far it goes down. How the main deck just goes down from the deck edge. Hmm. And and that's because it collided with a rock outcropping on its way down. Yes. Now, this is the pilot house. This is probably the most undamaged portion of the wreck. And on Slater, so the, the, the flying bridge on a John C. Butler is directly behind the pilot house, where Slater right. it is directly above the pilot right. house. So right. um, I, either way, you know, the officers are completely exposed here. What I love is the hatch, both here and in this photo, they're still dogged down. Yeah, and, and what and, and, and for for you miss go back to that one, no the other one the other one, uh, next one, no that one, okay for you museum ships people, look at the maintenance being done on the camouflage paint scheme. Yeah, <laughs> they were doing some spot corrosion PMS there. Right down below. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. you guys will recognize that. Somebody, somebody thought that that was, um, you know, that was uh, shrapnel damage. It's not. That's just spot maintenance. That's that's incredible, and it kind of goes to show that this deep in the ocean, there's nothing going on down there. Um, you and I had talked on the phone. I think it was either yesterday or today, and you had said uh, silt buildup zero, uh, uh, marine life practically zero. Yeah. Nothing is ha oh oh nothing has happened to the gouge marks in the uh, in the bottom of the ocean. I mean they right. are still nothing happens this deep. So when you see spot corrosion marks like that, they don't go. They're still there. They're still there. Now this is Mount Fifty Two. Uh, anybody who knows the Sammy B history knows that uh, this was Paul Carr's gun. He was the uh, Mount Captain. He ran this thing like a finely tuned watch. Probably had the best rates of fire of any five-inch gun crew in the Pacific Fleet, and uh, and, that, and that gun fired furiously throughout the entire battle until and, and, and they fired everything. They they fired star shells. They fired you know whatever whatever came up out of the handling room. They put in the breach and fired. And 
they fired almost all the ammunition. They got down to the next to the last round, uh, next to the last shell. They fired so often that the barrel was hot. The shell cooked off in the breach and blew out the mound, killing just about everybody on board. When um, when some of the other crew came around to see if they could help, they found Paul Carr, who's in a the picture there, attempting to load one the last shell into the breach of the gun. And they took it from him and laid it down. And they could see that he was mortally wounded. His midsection was just eviscerated. And they knew he didn't have long to live. And they turned to administer to some others. And Paul picked up that shell again and tried to load it again. It was a pretty moving moment for me to see this. Now, I did not dive on Sammy B. Roberts. We were, we were trying out a new sonar aboard a limiting factor and a French sonar technician, uh, Jeremy Morizé. Uh, took the observer seat in all the dives. But when I saw the, um, the imagery of this after the dive, you can actually see inside the mount. You can see where Paul Carr died. And here you can see the obvious damage that was caused by that live uh, shell cooking off inside the mount. Uh, we're back to that. Uh, this is, again, this is when, when Victor first... Okay, let's stop it here. Oh, when wow. Victor first started exploring Sammy B, uh, he saw it was broken right about here, about midships, and uh, right here where the where the K guns are on the starboard side. He did not see a stern, so he uh, started to rotate around the stern and and saw the area where Sammy B Roberts got hit by Congo's battleship shells along her port side. And the wreck was just split open and, at, at that point. And he did another another circle around the wreck, came back here, and then all of a sudden noticed that the stern is still there. What we're seeing here, and, and people have said that they're separated, bow and stern. They're not actually separated. We've got the bow, and then there's a break. But the break doesn't extend down to the keel or her lower hull strakes. She's still connected. Basically, when the, when the bow of the Sandy B hit that rock, crumpled, you still have the hole up here. It's kind of like Titanic, except Titanic hit soft mud, and her bow sliced 40 feet into the mud before the momentum bled off and she came to a stop. Roberts hit that rock and stopped, and, and the momentum crumpled her bow, and then her everything aft of the, of, of the uh, superstructure settled down across this rock outcropping and there's a little ridge here that basically broke her back and split her open like uh, a rotten banana uh leaving Mark, is this still attached, she, she split open so it was the damage from congo i believe that created the weakness which is why it happened in this area but it was the rock outcropping that did the rest of the damage the crumpling of the bow and then the splitting open of the hull and and her, her bow is like this way and her stern is angled down like this way and then it's separated by a gap but they're still connected down the way. Is, is this the port or starboard we're looking at this is starboard side you're at the k gun okay. starboard side looking forward okay so the stern is to the left correct okay it's almost coming into view this is the port side this is where congo hit her got it okay. now this damage was going to be uh, accentuated when she split open when she hit the bottom, but this is what this is what started it. This is where this is where Congo did. It. So what what frame is this? This is this is roughly a midship. It's roughly a midship. Yes, it's okay. it's right opposite the um, it's right outboard of the um, of the where the torpedo tubes were and the uh, after forty millimeter mount. Um, that 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 whole that whole uh, uh, deck house is, is just gone. Uh, that's why the tubes are lying by themselves um, a, a, a few hundred yards away. Uh, it's separated before she hit the bottom. Uh, this is just I don't even know why I sent this picture. Um, it just shows. Well, I, I, I took this from the uh, the video. Oh, okay. It's roughly the same, uh, same impact. Well, this is starboard side. This is where you start. This is this is back near the stern. Um, Mount Fifty Two is going to be just above here. Um, gotcha. I think there's a better picture that I sent to show the area better. Um, okay, now this is back at the stern. 
this is my biggest question about Sammy B. I don't know when this happened to her stern. Um, it's totally eviscerated. You're looking at the second platform deck level, and you're looking at the foundation for the steering gear. A little bit farther to the left, you'll see the actual, they're out of frame here, but you'll actually see the rudder posts. There we go. You'll see the rudder posts sticking up here. And the stern is just gone. This is this is the this is you know this is the actual stern of Sammy B. Roberts. Victor was hoping to see the name Sammy B. Roberts back on her stern, but it's gone. It's just completely gone. Um, I don't know what caused this. It, this. This did not happen upon impact of the bottom. Could have been a depth charge explosion like uh, Johnston experienced, but. According to survivor reports, the fantail was still intact when she left the surface, hmm. and there were no reports of explosions underwater. In fact, Copeland even specifically stated there were no explosions felt by any of the crew. Johnston survivors felt two explosions, which is where I get two explosions from, but not Sammy B. So I'm not sure what happened to the stern. This is my biggest mystery in Sammy B. So my understanding with John C. Butler, the depth charge storage is further forward. So I, I wouldn't think it'd be a depth charge internal explosion. Because this, this, this well, can't be pressure. One, like, one, thing I found out, thing from one, one thing I found out from uh, Hagen, uh, from oh. Lieutenant Hagen's son, is that uh, Hagen, Hagen said that um, first one of the one of the primary duties of a gunnery officer is to ensure that all the depth charges are safe uh, before battle like this. And he felt that he, uh, he felt that he failed in that because he felt, he physically felt the explosions after Johnston sank. And he said the only, the only depth charges that he couldn't check were the extra ones that Commander Evans had stored in after crew's burden. What? Yes. So, do you think something similar happened on Sammy B? They have all I'm saying charges. is I got that word about Johnston. I don't know that Sammy B. I have no evidence that Sammy B. did likewise. I'm just saying that it's a possibility. Is this too much damage to be uh, exposed just from the pressure as it sank, being buttoned up? Uh, yes, and and in other pictures, you'll see how the main deck is torn up and it's buckled up. It does look like something. Uh, I don't know if I included it here. Um, no, no, no. Yeah. It, I think anyway, I, I've got a picture that shows the the area where the the two uh, uh, twenty millimeters are on the start on the fan tail. That is all just blown up. Um, oh. They're they're at crazy angles to each other, and yeah, something something happened. And I don't know what it was. Uh, I, I've got, I've got, I got to spend. I have to spend more time on this and try and figure out what happened. Because not only that, look how eviscerated it is. There's nothing, right. it, it, just nothing in there. It's all torn out. The steering gear is just gone. Everything you know, back there is just gone. It's a hollow shell. So I don't know what happened back here. It's obviously not a machinery space. Not a boiler explosion. Nothing like that. I don't know. For Reference those of you that have been to the Slater, this is roughly where the laundry area is. Um, and then my office with the supply office is, is basically here as well. Um, so as you know, on, on the Slater, there's no ammunition really being stored back here. So it's so definitely why don't you tell us what you store in the supply office, Mr. Supply Officer. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it is my office, by the way, I have your tub right here. <laughs> nice. All right, I'll, I'll get out of this. It's a supply office. <laughs> so I, the ship was found about sixty five. The ship was about sixty five hundred meters, right? So you guys were about at the six thousand meter mark. Well, uh, no, we actually went all the way down. Johnson was a sixty five. Uh, Sammy D's more uh, sixty eight or sixty nine. And then uh, how close did the sixty eight sixty five meters? And then the camera, how close did that get? Like all right the way there. As, as close as we could without. Uh, risking entangling submersible on the wreck, we can't get really, we cannot get really close because of that risk of entanglement. But um, I mean, we, we're we're definitely down there with it. We're we're at, at Johnston. We when, when 
to, 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 to show how difficult it is to find these wrecks in the deep ocean. Even though we knew where Johnston was after at the end of her third dive, when we went down on the fourth dive, we couldn't find her again. It took us over an hour, and we did not. We couldn't find a debris field. We couldn't find the skid mark on the ocean. Victor ended up going out deep, and then coming up shallow, and we found her that way, and uh, came at her from another direction. So I've I've been down deeper. All I can say is I can check the pictures that I took in the submersible at the time, but I know that I've been down deeper than 60, 6,500 meters, which you know earns me a. A marking on my tattoo here. So whatever. This, this is my little log. Blue note shell back, a vessel and hail. Nice. Wow. I uh if you notice I, I didn't say a damn word while you guys were talking about that because the details you got into I I mean were amazing. Um pretty impressive. Well, one, thing, stuff. one thing I'd like to say. Uh, go ahead. I spent several months last year after Johnston doing the analysis and writing the rec report for the Navy. I am currently in the middle of doing the same effort for the same Navy. I want to share this information with you guys. You guys need to have this information as well. And so I jumped at the chance to get onto this when I was invited because I wanted to start this conversation with this museum ship mafia and, and get this information to you guys so you can help spread the word and that you can be as knowledgeable and you can learn as much from these wrecks as I have. And, um, and, and like I said, my knowledge started with studying a museum ship, in this case, Kit. But um, um, you, uh, you, guys, you guys probably also have things that you can teach me about this. And I'm not uh, the biggest surviving shellback. There's a guy named Don Walsh who's been to the uh, bottom of the Challenger Deep, which I've not been. He is the deepest dive in Navy Naval Academy graduate. I'm the second deepest diving. I have no <laughs> intention of breaking his record because that man's a hero, and I could I would never challenge the record of my hero. So. <laughs> Well, yeah, th I mean, this is, it's, it's fabulous to have you here, Parks, because, yeah, this is, starts a conversation. This is still relatively new. Everyone's trying to get the word out. And, I mean, yeah, this really can change how we view our own ships that we have here. Uh, and this kind of segues into, in October, we're having a naval architect here who has studied the wreckage of the Juno. And so we're going to kind of be doing something like you have been talking to us about uh, what you experienced down there. They'll be talking about the Juno wreck and uh, what they've experienced and how that changes potentially the story of the Juno uh, that we know from, uh, for, you know, eyewitness accounts. So this is, this really is a, yeah, I just can't thank Ken enough for bringing you here and um, you know, that we can interface like this. This is fabulous. It's very interesting. We um, we did we did some preliminary analysis on a lot of Vulcan's uh, imagery in a for a series that was uh, streamed on the streaming service Fox Nation called Lost Ships in World War II. Um, and and, and I, I got exposure during that series to some of Vulcan's other shipwrecks, including, like you say, Juno. I mean, looking at the three New Orleans class cruisers that were sunk in the Battle of Savo Island, the wrecks, every single wreck, the bow broke off uh, just forward of uh, the forward uh, five inch uh, mount. And this is not something that happened in battle. They didn't, they didn't suffer damage, but for some reason during the sinking process, the bows of Vincennes, Astoria, and Quincy broke off. And, and, so that, that raises the question. Now, I, I know we don't have a museum ship of that class, but it's, it's, it's how a wreck uh, acts underwater that could have a feedback kind of loop for these museum ships might indicate some weaknesses or, or something that you need to look at. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's, that's exactly what I was meaning. I had not heard that, uh, the Battle of uh, Savo Island there, but... Uh, that's pretty astounding, right? That like for those three ships. And to go off what Shane was saying too, like 
you know, we look at chips differently now. And just hearing you talk about, you know, your theories about uh, gun mount 52, say, and like hearing different, um, you know, like you being down there and seeing, I mean, we can look at pictures all day, but like you being there and being able to like, almost like reimagine what happened and, and get more information that, you know, books can only tell us so much or secondhand accounts or whatever, but you're, you're looking at this and able to make like new discoveries that haven't been made before. And I think that's amazing. I was very surprised at how much more I learned about the battle. We didn't get into too much detail about it, but we can talk offline about this or schedule another uh, video on this. But um, I learned a lot more depth about Johnston's battle on that day from the wreck. So far with Sammy B, I have not learned too much about the battle itself, but I'm just now starting the analysis, so we'll see where it leads. But basically what I'm getting from Sammy B wreck is confirmation of what we already know from Copeland and other eyewitnesses at the time. Um, so, so we'll see. But the potential is always there. Yeah, well, I, I think it kind of goes without saying we, we have to have you back because I can think of just some of the topics that you and I just discussed over the phone that we, I, I, I mean, that, that in and of itself would take up a whole other, whole other video. Um, I, I simply just don't know how to thank you. Uh, for yeah. for joining us this evening yeah. and and you know we talked about maybe you'd you'd hang around for a half hour you have given us an hour and fifteen minutes is it and, wow well Sorry. and and I'm I'm just thrilled because it's added a whole different or I should say a whole higher level to the discussion you know like Stephen said a few moments ago uh, using Mount Fifty Two on the Johnson as an example I always thought it was the impact underneath Mount 52. Matter of fact, Shane and I did a, uh, a joint video last summer about that subject. I always thought it was the shell hit underneath that sealed those guys' fate. Right, right. Uh, you just pointed out, no, it was that it was that hit that went right through the housing. In ricochet. That, that probably, yeah, yeah that probably and, did them all. Actually, what, what you described actually happened to Mount 51. Right. Um, no, none of the eyewitnesses described what happened to 51 except one witness saw it smoking and it was not operating anymore but looking at the wreck we can see the shell fired from Suzia which penetrated her main deck and went down into the ammunition uh, magazine below 51 and blew up through the bottom is what appears what okay if there aren't any more dives going on and everything, what is next for Park Stevenson? What what do you have coming up, or what what's next in this whole? I well, I don't even know how to describe it. You know, this whole study of yours, this whole adventure that 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 you've been putting together over the next uh, last couple of years. Okay. I no, I don't, no, don't, no, don't, no. I'm not asking you to do that. Okay, you know what I'm saying. I'm just saying. D don't don't cross that line but what okay. else are you let, let me let me let me put it this way i want to be a member of the museum ships mafia and i want to help <laughs> you in your mission of getting this uh, getting these stories out to everybody that comes to visit these ships and i'll leave it at that and and yeah uh in in the near future you might have a, an announcement to make but right now yeah we we are thrilled to have you as part of the museum ship mafia like i said a few moments ago you totally added a whole other dimension to this discussion that i don't think any of us could have expected let alone the viewers and and that's huge so i'm i'm definitely grateful um any last questions guys before we uh we let this gentleman go um, no, okay. I mean, I just look forward to working with you again. Yeah, I just look forward to Well, I'm going to pass, with, with Park's permission, I'm going to pass all of his uh, contact information on to you guys because I think you could just take this uh, so much further. And, and I mean, you know, hopefully it'd be a m museum ship mafia format, but even behind the scenes, I, I, the guy is just an incredible wealth of information that, that you, need, uh, you need to be in contact with. Yeah, well, John and I already know each other. Um, I'm coming back to Slater on October 20th to uh, present on Sandy B. So I'll see you then. 
And yeah, it's gonna be you great. guys in Buffalo, I, I so I've always known about you guys. I wanted to meet you. I didn't know if meeting another Stevenson would be like dark matter coming together. We can't sleep so I don't know. Yeah, but and then it doesn't closed. appear to have happened, so maybe we're yeah. good. Mm -hmm. nice. And I really followed what, what you guys were doing with the Sullivans. That was, that was, uh, that, 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 I was so worried when, when she took on flooding like that. Yeah. That you guys were able to get her back to float when you did and everything. So good job. That's on that. a whole other conversation, too. And, you know, we could uh, share <laughs> all those stories that, uh, you know, and then the technical side of it as well. Uh, so, yeah, we can look forward to your uh, comments and thoughts on that. Well, Parks, thanks again. I am going to let you go. I'm going to disconnect you. And uh, so we could take a few moments to talk behind your back. Uh, <laughs> but again, thank you. Thank you so much for all of the time. And we look forward to having you back here yeah. real soon. Yeah. Well okay, done. thanks to all thank of you guys. Thanks, thank Parks. You. Thanks, yeah. Parks. Keep these ships afloat. Thank you very much. You got it. Thank thanks, you. Parks. Uh, so oh. was that a worthy surprise? <laughs> yeah. 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 You outdid I, yourself. I, you outdid you, you, yourself. Yeah, you did. And <laughs> I mean, you know what? I always tell people like meeting people like Parks or anybody like in the museum field that I that I work with or anything, like these are my my rock stars, right? My my celebrity athletes. And like meeting someone like or working or talking with Parks is like that's for me. Like that I get excited the same way someone would get excited meeting like LeBron James or something. Right, right. So, I mean, that was, yeah. Thank you, Ken. Yeah, I, I mean, absolutely. And and just, you know, brief 30 seconds, he actually contacted me after I did the video on the Samuel B. Roberts uh, when they first uh, you threw some imagery out there. And he contacted me from the expedition ship. And oh uh, so... Yeah, so I knew who he was. He had a decent uh, satellite wireless signal, but then it wasn't until we started throwing the advertising, if you want to call it, like the notifications about what we're doing tonight. Uh, Thanks, I started doing that last Saturday that he all of a sudden responded. He said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I remember you. And and then that's how the conversation started. Wow. Uh, but like I, like I said a few moments ago, okay. of course, John already has his contact information, but I will definitely make sure that you guys have it because it could... It could just totally do so much more for the museum ship industry. It's a, he's an amazing guy. Um, How do you go above this, Ken? What's that? In only our Say second again? episode, you probably in only our second episode, you have. I've, I've already got it. No, 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 no. Yeah, exactly. I've already got I it. Say that. No. Where do we go if from here, thought, then? I've already got it worked out. Um, next episode, we are going to have John Epps' newest and biggest fan. My mother. <laughs> oh, he's just so articulate. I love him. Oh, he's oh. he's so well spoken. He's nice. he's so impressive. So nice. yeah, I'm gonna. <laughs> Your mom yeah. is gonna. So if you the... thought if you thought Parks was impressive, wait till you see the maternal unit come on the screen. Oh man. Um, <laughs> no, I don't know. I uh, you know what? It, it's going to take some collaboration. I think uh, you know, all joking aside, we've got to throw some polls out to the viewers. We got to throw some polls, some questions out to the subscribers. Uh, subscribers, you guys need to let us know what you want to talk about. I'm already sold on the concept that Shane and Steven, you know, put together, which is we've got to have a crossover event. I think we should do it, you know, uh, as, as long as we can, as long as the subject matter is driven by the viewers and subscribers. So whether it's something like, uh, we discuss convoy escorting, whether it's something like starting a book club where we read a different book and then have the author on and, and talk about how he wrote that book. It could be endless, but it's got to have, in my opinion, input from the viewers and subscribers. So you guys throw in some comments, throw in some questions. We'll put some polls together and we'll see what we can come up with next. This is fabulous. How does that sound? Great. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. all right. We got to get t-shirts made up. Museum shirts. Uh, t-shirts. Yeah, t-shirts or hats at least. Um, we'll come up with something. So I am working. There will be a website that's going to go live pretty quickly. Uh, stay tuned for uh, museumshipmafia.com. There's already a Facebook uh, page set up for it, but the website will go uh, live pretty quickly. So you know uh, check that stuff? out. I'm sorry? 
you, yeah, you're well, moving right along. I love it. We didn't. I don't think I knew about Facebook or anything about that. You know, so or did you? Uh, you well, then. You, so when do we thing. get our own serious satellite show? <laughs> hey, well, we don't need serious. This is going to be better than serious. Yeah, the yeah. um, no, keep an eye out for the uh the website. Uh, yeah. like I said, uh, Facebook. You guys will be able to contact us any way you want. You'll be able to learn about uh more about what John F does on the Slater. You'll be able to learn more about what Shane and Stephen do behind the scenes at the Buffalo Naval Park. Uh, it's all it's all good stuff, and we want to have you be a part of it. Um, John Epp for the USS Slater. What do you have coming up? What do you want to promote? What do you want to mention? Uh, let's see. Um, end of this month into the fall, our overnights will be starting again. We stop them during the summer because it's too hot. So if anyone's in the area as a group, uh, you want to do an overnight, it's great sleeping on the Slater. Uh, Parks already mentioned it in October, October 20th, I believe it is. It's our annual fundraiser um, here in Albany. Uh, he'll be one of two speakers, I believe, where the second one is, I believe it's been announced, but I don't want to say anything, but he's uh, a very powerful man. Um, <laughs> if you feel like supporting us through that, um, you can just go on our website and just, uh, you can donate through that. Of course, become a member, 25 bucks a year, help support the ship and uh, follow us on Facebook. Every day there's posts, maintenance work, historical blogs on other destroyer escorts um all the videos that we put out um yeah that's about it yeah def definitely check out the uss slater's facebook page um and then of course the youtube channel search for uss slater as i said at the beginning of the broadcast they just top 650 subscribers every new subscriber counts you may not think it our, does our much goal but is a thousand does. by the end of the year so we're, i don't we're see really why we there. can't help you Good. get there, get you there. Yeah. yeah absolutely cool. Yeah. And then finally, check out ussslater.org uh, for the upcoming events. And then uh, Shane, Stephen, what about the Buffalo Naval Park? What's next? What's on the radar for you guys? Uh, I think we're just kind of focusing on our road trip that's coming up. And oh, you. Well, we have a lot of stuff coming on. We have Shane the. Has uh, a, what? Shane has an exhibit opening on. Monday. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Time, time out. Real, real quick. I'm sorry to interrupt, but. For those that are still on, I see Michael Phillips, I see Ed Webster, Sonny the Soccer Cat. We are going to be on the hunt. We're going to need guest moderators. Um, Steven is way too busy to be able to respond well, to was, all of your questions. I was, just, I was in admiration and, tonight. And usually I'm on yeah, it. Usually so, I'm, but I'm like, just like, you know, nah. like parks, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I saw um, Steven you know, kind of skid out a little off there. I, I, I had a I had to use the facilities. <laughs> well, if anyone is interested in being a guest moderator to uh, bring questions up on the screen, to uh, highlight questions that need to be answered. We'd love to get your help. We'd love to have you guys help us out. Uh, shoot, You can shoot us uh, an email. Uh, shoot me an email at historyxchannel at gmail.com. Um, you know, people know get a hot know how to get a hold of me. I don't yeah, I'm very cool. easy to get a hold of. Yeah. So uh shoot me an email and let me know if you want to be a guest moderator for a future broadcast. Now, with that being said, all right, sorry to cut you guys off. Buffalo no, Naval Park. Right. Yeah, so real quickly, um we do have the National Submarine Convention here in the week of August 22nd or whatever, around that time. Then we have the Little Rock uh convention here the same week so we've got the croaker guys and all the sub uss vi sub guys we've got uh the little rock here uh and all you know all of the old salts that served aboard the little rock uh and then we have our annual fundraiser as well and it's all in the same week if you can believe it all yeah. three conventions and our annual fundraiser because that's the way we do it here we we uh what do you want to say how non -stop. do we stop it's just non-stop right so that's how we do it here at the naval park <laughs> cram as many things in as you can. So that's what's really coming up uh, for us over the next two weeks, three can, weeks. Can I ask how you guys do all this? I, I swear every <laughs> single day on Facebook, I see the Buffalo Naval Park saying, yeah, we just had this ceremony today. Oh, we got one tomorrow. We have this new um, monument. How are you doing this? Day. I've been here since 730 this morning. Yeah, I know, no, John, you, you, you'd work. You, these are like 12 hour days for you as well. Uh, I think we do it uh, because we, 
you know, yeah, we do it because we ah, have dude. to do it. It's, uh, you know, we are. How do you get anything else done? I, I don't understand. Well, it. that's a great question, John. And uh, that could be for further discussion later. Uh, <laughs> a lot of the stuff uh, does get some things do get put by the wayside. So, uh, yeah. well, and I'd be willing to bet that when I send in. you guys. I, when I send you guys group emails to put these together, here's the next subject. Here's what we're going to do. I imagine there's got to be a lot of eye rolling because you've, you've, you're working your butts off all day long, 12 hour days. And like now all of a sudden, here's another email from history X. No, no, not at all. I um, do most I of it at home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really? I was, I was kind of excited to, to do the research and I sent him a bunch of stuff that he yeah. already knew, but I didn't, I wasn't too well versed in it. And I, did a bunch of research on it. I mean, I have two pay two full pages of notes here. Um, so no, like when you sent that over, it was like, oh, that's right, I got to do that. So, I mean, I'm a nerd for that stuff. Well, fantastic, and uh, yeah, we'll yeah. have to come up with another good subject to beat this one, which should be well, pretty I look easy. Forward to your I'm next confident. emails, Ken. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, when it comes to the uh, Buffalo Buffalo and Erie County Naval and Military Park. Uh, search for Buffalo Naval Park. If you haven't checked out their YouTube channel, uh, again, just incredible videos like the one I referenced earlier. If you want to find out how a Fletcher class destroyer makes smoke, Shane goes into this uh, engine compartment with a flashlight. It's dark as hell. And he lays out how they pump raw fuel into the system and just create this black smoke. As a mechanical engineer that I am, I thought it was fascinating. So if you like videos like that, if you geek out over engineering spaces, that type of thing, check out the USS Slater. Check out the Buffalo Naval Park. You will not be disappointed. And you can also catch the Buffalo Naval Park at www.buffalonavalpark.org. How'd I do? Uh, it's like you've done it before, Ken. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, with that being said, uh, I want to thank everyone for... Uh, tuning in, you know, like, Thank like we started much. off uh, with a broadcast, we can't do it without viewers, uh, without people watching and throwing out your suggestions. So that's, that's really important. It means the world to us and keep the comments coming. If there isn't, isn't anything else guys that I'll leave it at this. My name is Ken Stano with the YouTube channel history X. Thank you for uh, checking it out. And I hope everyone has a great evening.